Good morning, everybody. This is the first uh, seminar colloquium for this uh, new year after holidays. And for this first uh, uh, Severo Cho colloquium, we have uh, uh, the honor of the talk by Francois Combes. She will talk about active galactic nuclei, feeling and feedback. And Isabel Marquez will uh, introduce her properly. Isabel. Hello, good morning everybody and thank you very much for being here again. Welcome back after summer holidays and um, I guess this year is, um, these holidays have been especially weird with the difficult situation we are fi facing all over the world. So th thanks again for being here. Uh, Francoise Combe um, is a researcher at the Paris Observatory um, and she is uh, since uh, 2014 professor at the Collège de France where she, she's chair of galaxies and cosmology. Uh, she's also a member of the French Academy of Science since 2004, where uh, being chair of the Universal Science section. She's scientific editor of Astronomy Astrophysics, the journal, since 2003. Um, and uh, she is, um, since 19, uh, 2019, she's the vice president of the Assembly of Professors in Collège de France and member of the uh, editorial board of Euclid uh, Consortium. She was president of the French Astronomical and Astrophysical Society and co-director of the CNRS, so the um, National Research uh, Council in, in France. And, and also she, were, she was um, uh, president of the French Committee of the International Scientific Unions and vice president of the uh, International Year of the Astronomy 2009 Committee. Uh, she got an ERC advance grant in 2010, so among the first ones, and has received a number of awards and distinctions, among which I uh, cite just a few of them. He, uh, she got the silver medal of the CNRS in 2001, the Natico Bright Prize from the European Astronomical Society in 2009, the Honorary Fellow of the uh, Royal Astronomical Society in, in 2013, the same year, the P Petri Prize of the Canadian Astronomical Society, the um, Award Gordon Bourlis Maidner in 2017, and she's Commander of the French National Order of Merit uh, since last year. In 2017, um, a high school in Montpellier was renamed as uh, Francois Combe. And uh, in the uh, ceremony, the director of the high school said, I mean, I just quote the, the sentence that uh, translated to English, we were looking for the name of a remarkable woman, a woman of values to rename this high school. The name of Francoise Combe very quickly imposed itself. With her head in the stars, but her feet firmly on the ground, she's both a teacher, researcher, and editor of a specialized magazine. She's also a passionate person, an educator, and a remarkable woman of modesty. And um, I fully agree with these last sentences. In fact, uh, what I've been saying, uh, um, I mean, I had to look for that in the internet because she, she, she just sent us a, just a, a, a small, quite modest par paragraph of what she, what she did, I mean, of, of her CV. She is an expert of the formation and evolution of galaxies in a cosmological context, including galaxy dynamics, the spiral uh, and bar structures and the interaction between galaxies, studied both through multi-wavelength observations and numerical simulations. In, in particular, she has shown how bars growth or weaken in spiral disks how circular evolution can form pseudo bulges and, um, and how bars can drive the gas to the center uh, to feed supermassive black holes. She has published extensively on the interest of medium of galaxies, studying the molecular gas which gives birth to new stars in, in nearby galaxies and, and which can be found also in high redshift systems. She has contributed to various models of, of dark matter, also interested in alternative solutions. Uh, with more than uh, um, 1,100 publication in ADS, about 600 referred papers, papers with more than 28,000 citations, H81. She also published numerous reviews, uh, very often giving invited talks on the most relevant, uh, relevant international meetings. Uh, with her team, she has recently discovered molecular Torah in the circonocular regions of AGN with ALMA, and she will talk about that now in her work, Black Human Entitled, Active Galaxy, uh, Active Galactic Nuclei, Thulin, and Feedback. Thank you very much, Francoise. And this Thank is you very much, way. Isabel. <laughs> it's a very, very nice of you. So I will, <clears throat> I will speak about uh, today about ALMA results that we get uh, 
recently. And just to put the scene, I want to put now the, the recent uh, uh, view that we have about the circumnuclear regions uh, around uh, uh, Aegean. So uh, it was for a long time the paradigm to find the dusty torus, that is, uh, those who are uh, obscuring Cipher 1 to give Cipher 2, where the uh, central engine is masked by dust. But in fact, we have this kind of picture now, uh, essentially due to the mid infrared interferometer with the VLT, that has uh, shown that there is no dusty torus. In fact, there, when you look at the dust, it is seen in a polar uh, region perpendicular to the disk. Uh, here you have uh, the black hole, the supermassive black hole, which is the broad line region, and we have an emission of uh, blue light, big blue bump is called here. And inside a certain radius, you have no dust and no molecules because it's sublimation radius here. And what you see is a dust in a polar, polar, polar cone, and the molecules in a disk, the thin disk that you find also it's two meters. So this is good to have in mind with uh, what would I would describe now. So my outline of the talk will be the first part of the feeding of the black hole. We wanted to know with the high resolution of ALMA, how the gas is going to the center because there is a big problem is the angular momentum problem. The gas is rotating and you have to remove the angular momentum. We'll see that bars and spirals will do that. The second part will be the feedback. We have observed in recent years, a lot of molecular outflows that uh, eject the gas and stop the star formation. And the third will be our discovery with ALMA of molecular tori, which are completely um, decoupled from the rest of the disk because they have different orientation and different kinematics. So first I want to recall some briefly to understand the rest, the sum, uh, what we, we know about bar galaxies. So bar galaxies, you have stars that have some uh, periodic orbits. And the periodic orbits, if you have a bar parallel to the OX, for instance, horizontal here, you have ellipses that are parallel to the bar or perpendicular and they change orientation by 90 degrees at each resonance. And you can see the resonance, for instance, at the top right here, you see a galaxy in B minus V color. So you see the blue uh, star forming region and they are in general in rings. You find the rings at the inner Lindblad resonance in the center, a ring at corrotation and a ring at the outer Lindblad resonance. And you see that are perpendicular, parallel and so on. So, uh, what I will tell in the ALMA observation is uh, very much related to these rings of uh, uh, resonant rings of uh, Lindblad. And when you have these orbits, for instance, a bar parallel, you have these uh, uh, parallel orbits for the stars, but for the gas, it begins to, to follow these orbits. But then the main difference is that there's dissipation. The gas clouds are, um, are colliding and then all these orbits are tilted, tilted, and uh, until they form a spiral. So the main action would be the torque exerted by the bar on the spirals to exchange the angular momentum. And of course, we want to know where are these resonances. And when you have uh, the rotation curve in a galaxy, here you have the diagram where you have the radius and you have the frequencies. The omega is a rotation frequency. It's only the velocity V over the radius R, omega, and then you can build this curve, omega minus kappa over two or plus kappa over two. The kappa is the epicyclic frequency, is the, the frequency of uh, uh, making some ellipses around the uh, circular rotation. And uh, when you have a bar which has a constant pattern speed, omega P here, then when these curves uh, encounter this omega minus kappa over two, you have here the corrotation, one resonance, uh, inner Lindblad resonance that I would call IRR here, and the outer. And uh, it has been shown also that uh, sometimes, of course, uh, the gas is uh, going to accumulate at the rings, we have seen in the picture uh, previously. And uh, when you have gas going to the center, all these frequencies will go up because you have more mass. And it will be difficult to maintain this uh, processing uh, uh, orbits to the same omega p. So in some times you have a nuclear bar decoupling, and this has been simulated by n-body simulation by Friedli and Martinet, for instance, in 1993. You see in the simulation the stars 
forming a bar, and then suddenly a second bar decouples, nickel bar. And when you see the gas, there is a spiral structure, a ring at ILR, and also a nickel bar. And this is very important, as you will see, to understand the feeling of the black hole. And to know in which sense this angular momentum is removed or gained, in fact, you have this very uh, schematic and intuitively uh, understandable uh, uh, sense. Here you have a bar along the OX, horizontal, and the corrotation here. In general, the bar is ending at corrotation. And you have a two spiral arms, like in a bar galaxy. And you know the bar is splitting the, the plane in four quadrants with the sign of the tangential force. The tangential force is, is uh, giving the torque. Here you see that the tangential forces that I've uh, seen here is restoring the matter towards the potential well of the bar, which is horizontal. So it's easy to see that the, the forces will be in that sense. And if the rotation of the galaxy is this, you can see that the uh, torque will be positive. So you will gain angular momentum and the gas will go from quotation to the outer Lindbrand resonance or OLR and you will find a ring at the OLR. But if you prolong this spiral structure inside the uh, quotation here, here you have the spiral arms which are seen in bar galaxies as a dust lanes, which is characteristic of the bar. Inside the bar you have the dust lanes. In fact, it is a prolongation of this spiral structure. And of course, you see that uh, now the uh, tangential forces are restoring to the potential well in the horizontal things, and they are negative with respect to the rotation. And now all the gas will come from co-rotation to the ILR, and they will accumulate that. Why they accumulate there? Because then they are in the symmetry axis of the bar, and the torque in average is zero, and they can stay for a while. And it is uh, how we can measure, quantify, in fact, the torques exerted on, from the bar to the gas, because we can compute the, the forces by the potential. The potential is due essentially to the old stars, because in the center, uh, two or three kiloparsec, the dark matter is negligible. It's uh, in general the dark matter halo at the outer parts. So inside, you can say that most of the potential and the forces are due to the old stars. So you take an red image or near infrared image to be get rid of the dust. And then you deproject it like a disc and you form this kind of uh, picture, which is the bar is here. And you have this uh, four quadrants again. Positive is red. So you have a positive torque in these two quadrants and negative is blue. And then you can compare uh, where is the gas. And the gas is observed by the molecular gas, CO gas, and the contours are exactly the density of the gas that we observed with, for instance, IRAM or ALMA. And you see that the gas mainly is in the blue zone. There's a small part in red, but mainly in the blue. So when you make the average uh, around the circles here, you can compute the uh, torques, that is the uh, um, angular momentum, variation of angular momentum uh, driven in or out uh, relative to the angular momentum at certain radius, which is the velocity multiplied by the radius in one rotation. And you can see, for instance, in this galaxy, it is a large amount that you remove at each rotation. You can remove 20, 25%. So in three or four rotations, you can be, all the gas can be the center to feed the, the nucleus. And this is how we can quantify these torques and uh, the time scale of the gas coming to the center. And uh, in the past, we have done this with uh, Santiago Garcia Borillo and collaborators. We have done uh, with the resolution of the IRAM interferometer, that the plateau de Bure interferometer, and uh, about 20 galaxies were observed nearby Cephere. And we found that only in one third of them, there was a negative torque, that is a smoking gun evidence that the uh, AGN was feed, fed by the bar at a 10 or 100 per sec uh, scale, because of course we had not enough resolution. And in the other two thirds, it was not, it, is, it was like this one, for instance, uh, 6951, where when you make a zoom on the bar here, you find a, a ILR at the nuclear ring here, the bar is here. And when you make a zoom here, you see that indeed the molecular gas is uh, driven, it's not going to the center. 
And when you make a simulation, okay, at the top right, you have a simulation, three snapshots of a numerical simulation. And at the right, you have a zoom of the left the column. And here you see at the beginning, you have the gas accumulating at this ILR. And then progressively, there is a nuclear bar coming and it depopulates the ring and then you can drive the gas to the center because of the nuclear ring, which uh, uh, nuclear bar and nuclear ring. And indeed, in this galaxy, 6951, you see how uh, empty uh, the center is, in fact, exactly. So now, uh, with knowing this at 100 parsec scale, we wanted to, to know what is happening at smaller scale. So looking to 10 parsec scale with ALMA, which came to 2012, about, so eight years from now, and uh, in the cycle zero, we tried to observe this kind of uh, bar galaxy. This one is a prototype, 1433, where you have uh, three rings, one at the ILR here. This is an HST picture. You have the dusty uh, spiral arm at the, inside the bar, and then you have a big uh, spiral arm in the outside. And here you make a zoom. You see in blue the HST picture. So it's a uh, young stars and uh, also some star formation asteroids. And uh, in uh, orange, you have the ALMA CO, uh, seen in CO322 in band 7, and with high resolution. And you see that there is not only the big ring, the big ILR, but we discovered the second ring that was not uh, seen in HST. But in CO, we see clearly a second ring. And also in this galaxy, we saw also a small uh, outflow in the minor axis. We saw some velocity here. And it was one of the mildest outflow, about 7% of the mass was in the outflow. But when uh, you look uh, in detail and we deprojected the galaxy to compute the torque, in fact, the torque was positive. So it was not uh, feeding the, the nucleus. In fact, uh, the gas inside the second ILR ring is going outside to accumulate in the ring, and there is no feeding. So it's a case where uh, still you are not explaining the feeding at 10 parsec scale. And you see inside, it was not possible to measure because it's an outflow. But from here, you see that it is negative there. So it's a gas going to the ring from outside and from inside, but uh, in the ring at 200 parsec, you still have some accumulation of gas. So this was not a good uh, feeding case, but this second one, the NGC 1566, was indeed a very nice uh, Cephat one. You see, um, a bar here, a spiral structure uh, outside the rotation. And what we are looking at the field of view here is this uh, square, red square. And you see the zoom here. Uh, the uh, ring, the ILR ring is barely seen because we are at the border of the field of view. But what we see is the center. And the big surprise in the center is that there is a nuclear spiral in CO, in molecular gas, a nuclear spiral. And the nuclear spiral is training because the sense of rotation is like this. It is training. You see also the velocity field, the blue and red side. It's quite regular, although there is some streaming motion due to the nuclear spiral. But why uh, was it a surprise to see the nuclear bar which is trailing? Because we were expecting it uh, uh, a leading one. And uh, I explained before this uh, uh, elliptical uh, periodic orbits parallel to the bar or perpendicular. Here it is in the frame of the rotating bar. So at co-rotation, you don't make any turn. We are here just making an epicycle. And uh, when you have gas, then it uh, rotates progressively due to uh, dissipation and rotation. And uh, this uh, processing rate of omega minus kappa over two that you compute from the rotation curve V of R, which is observed, then you see how the gas, when it is dissipative, it is coming from uh, outside, and the processing rate, omega minus kappa over 2, is increasing, increasing, so meaning that the ellipses are rotating in one sense, and it makes a trailing spiral. And after this maximum, which in general corresponds to the ILR, you are going to decrease. So the ellipses are rotating in the other side. That's why in all these parts, we are expecting a a leading spiral, you know, all these ellipses rotate in the other sense than in this sense. So when there is no black hole in the center, you're expecting a leading spiral. But when you are have a black hole and you see the all the frequencies are going up again, and it's very small space, it's uh, the sphere of influence of the black hole, which is in general 20 parsec or so. So here at this distance, 
you have the Keplerian potential, one over R, and all frequencies, V, omega, omega minus kappa over two, everything is going up. So the sense of uh, rotation is again going up, and you can also reverse the sense of winding of the spiral, and you have a trailing spiral. So if we observe a trailing nuclear spiral, that means that we are inside the sphere of influence of the black hole, and we are changing the sense of the exchange of angular momentum. That's why you, uh, when we compute the torques again, so here is the bar, the deprojected galaxy. You have again the four quadrants. One is red for positive and blue for negative. And you see that the, the trailing nuclear spiral is in the negative range, in the blue zone. And when you, you average out of red guy, you, you indeed see that the, the, the torque is negative. And it's very, very important. You find half of the angular momentum is lost in one rotation. So in two rotations, the gas will be uh, at the center and feed the agent. So it's really smoking gun evidence that you have feeding the agent. So we understand really that we were not understanding that with a hundred parsec scale. Now we, we see the nuclear spiral and how the gas is feeding the agent. And it is not the only case. We found this uh, a small trailing spiral also in 1808. Here you have seen also in C13. So in about 30% of the case, we see this uh, nuclear spiral, which is training. Here you see it in uh, CO322. We see it in HCN, which is a, a dense gas tracer, HCN423. You see in HCO+, you see also the velocity field. And the beam at this uh, second cycle uh, of the ALMA was four per second resolution, 0 0.08 per second. So we are beginning to have more resolution than HST. And we are now, now uh, going to 20 mass milliard second, so 0 0.02 a second resolution now, the last observation. So it's very impressive to see that uh, we have enough gas in the center to be sensitive enough and to have the high resolution. And uh, it was observed, this galaxy, also by other uh, competitors like Salah Qatar before, but they had not enough resolution, so they don't see, they see the, the ILR, but in the center, they don't see the nuclear spiral. You see, uh, it was not enough resolution. So you need high resolution to see what's happening in the center. And uh, here they, they have not identified any, uh, they call it nuclear spiral, but in fact, it is inside this blue point that we see the nuclear spiral. In uh, 613, we have also this kind of thing. Here you have, now we know that uh, usually you have this ILR ring with a dust link here coming up. And inside this ILR, you see this small trailing spiral that was not seen again in the uh, lower resolution ALMA and Miyamoto at all resolution. Here uh, we have a velocity field with the same scale here, which is 10 per second of the box. And we make a zoom here by a factor of 10. So you have one arc second here instead of 10 arc second. And what you see at one arc second uh, box here is the spiral. So the spiral is the con contours, the CO322 contours, which are spiral. And in the color, we say the continuum. The continuum is the synchrotron continuum due to the GN. So what we see is something uh, also in molecules, which is decoupled, but it is inside the spiral structure. And what you see at this scale here, you find HCO plus, uh, what we call the molecular torus is exactly this, which is a 10 per sec scale. We find the torus and we find the velocity. And what you, you look, which is quite clear on here, is that the major axis, kinematic major axis is north-south. You have the red and the blue here. While at the scale of 100 per sec, the ILR, it is 45 degrees. So you see what I mean by decoupled, you have not the same position angle of the kinematics at 100 per sec scale and at 10 per sec scale. That's why it is molecular torus, which is decoupled. And in this uh, 613 or so, we have computed the torques to know if this uh, spiral, nuclear spiral was feeding. And in fact, yes, you see the DL over L in one rotation is 100%. So it's mean that in one rotation, you are feeding the black hole with this nuclear spiral. Here we have a sketch of what we see. We have also a small radio jet inside the, the ILR and the small spiral. And we have seen also the feedback. So I passed the second part of my talk, the feedback. 
we have seen for 613 this uh, uh, feedback along the radio jet that we have seen already with the VLA in the black contours here you have the centimeter radio jet uh, seen by the VLA and uh, you see the PV diagram you see how uh, is strong the gradient of velocity which is not at all the normal rotation but it is a very high gradient that we barely resolve even with the uh, ALMA we see the blue wing and the red wing and they are aligned along the radio jets that we have a zoom here you have the blue and red wing so it is a molecular outflow and it is parallel to the radio jet that we see in the gray contours so we have typically the dm over dt the uh, amount of radio uh, the molecular outflow which is 15 solomas per year so it's uh, rather uh, important for feedback in 1808 where I already shown you this uh, small spiral structure, nuclear spiral that were filling the center. We don't find any outflow. You see the PV diagram, it's normal. There is no very big gradient along the center, a major axis or minor axis. While it was surprising because uh, this is a galaxy at large scale with HST is known to have a super wind. You see uh, dust lanes uh, uh, perpendicular to the disk. There are dust lanes like this. It's like M82 where you have a super wind and um, you have dust lane going out perpendicular to the disk at the two kiloparsec scale. So we think that uh, uh, this uh, super wind is due to the starburst, uh, which is uh, seen at 100 parsec scale. But when you go to the nucleus at the AGN scale, there is no outflow. So the outflow is not going from the AGN, but from the starburst. So if you have resolution, you can distinguish between AGN feedback and supernovae feedback. And uh, with the CO and even HCN, we, we can distinguish also what is due to the uh, AGN excitation. Here you have a, a variation of the ratio HCN over CO plus, uh, 4 to 3, and a CS also that we see 7 to 6. ALMA is very good because you have a large wide band and you can have several lines. Simultaneously with the CO3 to 2, you have all these lines. And we know that when you are looking towards the AGN, you have uh, X-rays and hard radiation that uh, uh, boost the HCN. And indeed, when you are near the AGN, you have these red points here. And near the starburst, you have the blue point. So uh, the molecules can also uh, disentangle between AGN and, uh, and starburst. So for the AGN feedback that I am now describing, what are the mechanisms? In fact, uh, we have uh, identified uh, in the literature uh, two kinds of uh, agent feedback. The first one is called the quasar mode, uh, which uh, is uh, happening when you have a very powerful quasar or a powerful AGN, when the luminosity is almost Eddington. That is, the accretion rate is also uh, accretion rate of Eddington limit and uh, it is uh, in general rare. In the nearby universe, you have a luminosity which was much lower, lower than 1% Eddington. And in that case, you have not a super wind, that is the radiation pressure is not enough to compensate gravity. So uh, for this, we have no super wind due to the GN, uh, only to the starburst. And uh, when you are in this low luminosity regime, then you can have a radio jet. And in fact, we have already seen in 613 that uh, the radio jet can indeed untrain some molecular gas, especially if the radio jet is in the plane of the galaxy, because you have not alignment perpendicular to the galaxy. In general, you have a very radiatively inefficient flow, which are called ADAF. And uh, all the galaxies of CIFR that I've shown in this uh, uh, presentation are from this case that you have the radio mode. For instance, uh, NGC 1068, which is at the limit of the radio mode and uh, because it's still uh, uh, some um, near the 2% Eddington also, you see a, a, a spiral structure, a bar. You see the ILR again. Here's a CO625 that we have done with uh, Santiago Garcia Murillo with ALMA. Uh, you see the, the small scale. You see also a particularity that the AGN, the black hole, is not particularly the center of gravity of the ILR. It's true that the AGN can move and wander a bit, but still is inside the ILR. And in this uh, direction, 45 degrees almost, 
you have uh, the bar, but also the, the uh, jet. You have a radio jet and you have a, a flow. We have seen a flow, which is certainly in the plane of the galaxy. Here you have a sketch of the galaxy which you had drawn, and the flow is uh, uh, sweeping out some of the molecular gas which is in the plane. That's why it's so efficient because it's coupled to the plane. It's not perpendicular to the plane where there will be nothing to sweep out. So that's why you have an outflow of 63 solar mass per year, uh, a rather efficient uh, feedback. And here we also uh, saw inside the ILR, so this was the ILR, the ring that we have in the center. And now we can go uh, at higher resolution to the very, very thing, which is a molecular torus. Uh, here we have the seven parsec resolution in CO625. You see in the contours, the continuum, of the emission of the dust. At this frequency, you can see the peak of the dust emission, not only the synchrotron of the AGN, but the dust emission. And you see the dust is in the polar direction again. As, I, uh, as we have seen in the mini infrared in the optical, uh, we have seen the, the polar direction. Here you see this also with 0 0.625. But what you see with the lower uh, J of the rotation of CO, we see in CO2 to 1, this molecular torus, which is exactly perpendicular to the jet under the flow. And this, uh, there is a galaxy which uh, have water measure, and the water measure is exactly along this molecular torus. And here you see exactly with the picture that was uh, showing at the first slide, this uh, polar, uh, hollow polar cone here. And this is a beautiful uh, image done by Gratado et al. with sphere in the near infrared at the VLT. And they are making the difference with a central symmetric to, to show better and to, to put better in evidence. It is a polarized light only. And you see that indeed you have this polar cone uh, in the dust. You don't see the dusty torus that were the paradigm of the unification theories. You see a molecular torus which is thin, but uh, all the dust is in the polar direction. And here you see the, the this uh, the ring here in the near infrared and the contours are from the CO. We see exactly a, a very good alignment. And uh, this is not only 1068. You see the, the 149 AGN have been done with the mini infrared and uh, also with uh, uh, interferometer. And you see that uh, indeed when you have a radio jet or the major axis uh, perpendicular to the disk here, the polar the direction of the dust is really uh, seen. So the dust is not parallel to the disk, but in the polar direction. So this is the main surprise that was seen with high resolution. And since I want, I'm speaking of feedback and molecular outflow, I want to show this particular one, which is very spectacular. This is the galaxy 1377, which is very, very uh, radio quiet. Uh, why we say it's a radio quiet? Because there is a very good correlation between the radio emission at centimeter wavelengths and uh, the infrared, which is a star formation uh, indicator. So it's a very well known correlation, and maybe the best in astrophysics with a little scatter. And here there is far infrared and very small radio, radio emission. We see in the valley the center, but we don't see an eject. Maybe we are not sensitive enough. But what you see here is a CO322 emission made with the uh, Susanna Alto et al. Uh, in uh, red, it is a redshifted, a red wing of the spectrum. In blue, it is a blue wing, a blue shifted uh, uh, gas of CO322. And in gray, you have the center of the line. Center of the line is like uh, the polar cone. In fact, you seem to have a disk here and the molecular outflow, which is perpendicular. This was at low resolution with the dispersion of velocity in this direction again. And when you go at high resolution with ALMA, we have observed this uh, different cycle. You see it's very, very thin. So it's not that the uh, molecular uh, outflow is exactly at the, the edge of the cone at all with the dust, but it is at the spine of the cone. It's really a, a, a jet, in fact although there is no radio jet. Maybe the radio jet is gone and you see only the, the, the gas which was entrained by the radio jet, we don't know, but it's very funny. And also what is funny is that the, the jet is, or the molecular outflow is processing. 
because uh, first you see the blue and the red, and then it changes sign. You see the red and the blue, which means that uh, sometimes it's going towards you, and then it's recessing from you. So it's in, almost in the plane of the sky, but processing by 10 degrees is sufficient to explain that. When you make a model, well, first we think that the collimation can only due to the radio jet because you have a, a ionized uh, plasma that is collimated by the uh, magnetic fields, which are rotated by the rotation here. And uh, you cannot collimate, if you have not a radio jet and an ionized gas, you cannot collimate the gas like this. So we think that it's not a wind, but a jet. And for the precession, we can be inspired by the microquasar that you see in our own galaxy, for instance, SS433, which is exactly that. You are processing by uh, uh, 10 degrees or so. And this is nice to see it in microquasar because it's at a human scale. You can monitor it and see the variation from day to day. But of course, for CFLs, you cannot see it. But uh, we have done this kind of simulation uh, with 10 degrees uh, precession. And indeed, uh, here your observation and model. And we, we succeed to find this kind of uh, precession. So it's quite interesting to see that we, we find molecular outflow that precess, like the, maybe the radio jet that we're in training it. But of course, you have also uh, some gas which is less velocity, which is in the edge of the uh, cone, like a wind. So we think, like in this simulation, that can have both. First, a uh, very strong velocity uh, jet, and also some wind, which is due to the maybe uh, uh, radiation pressure on dust. And the dust is indeed on the edge of the polar uh, cone. So we can see both, in fact. OK, so in the third part here, I will uh, uh, show how we have discovered this molecular torus. I uh, recall. This I have already shown for 613, this uh, nuclear spiral and the molecular torus that we see uh, very clearly in HCO plus at this scale. Here is a molecular torus and the uh, completely uh, different position angle. We see that in several cases, for instance, 1326. Here you have a bar galaxy, the OLR, the uh, ILR, which is this small white a ring and this small white ring is this ring that you see with HST in pink because there is a lot of star formation and the field of view of ALMA is this so this is the ILR and again inside the ILR you see this molecular torus which is decoupled almost adjoint here with the AGN of the uh, synchrotron uh, emission of the AGN. We see also in 1365 the very well known bar galaxy and there is the ILR here you see the ALR is elongated along the bar, it's an ellipse. And inside the ILR, you have this small uh, pink here, which is with a zoom, you can see a molecular torus. It's almost face on, this one, so that you can see a hole in the center. Of course, we, we think that there must be a hole because the molecules will be destroyed in the center, but we don't know exactly uh, inside what's happening. And uh, summarizing out of the eight, uh, nearby cephra that we have looked at, we, we find seven molecular torus, not in this case where there was no filling, but in all the rest we see uh, tori with a radius of 10, 20 parsec scale, uh, mass of H2 about 10 to the 7, a few 10 to the 7, and mainly the inclination of the torus which is different from the inclination of the galaxy. So the main characteristic is a misalignment of the molecular torus and the main galaxy. So we have to understand why. And there are several mechanisms. I can uh, just cite a few. One is the uh, radiation-driven warping instability proposed by Pringer and simulated by Malone and Begelman. The principle is that you have photons that uh, in ping on this uh, warped uh, disk. And then it is re-radiated in a direction which is different. But, so there is a torque that are uh, maintaining the warping, so it's uh, unstable. You can have magnetic instabilities, but you can have also this very interesting relativistic effect, which is a bardeen peterson effect, which is uh, due to the fact that when you have a, a black hole spin rotating, with a spin which is not aligned with the matter around, you have a relativistic effect that uh, you, uh, the frame, the space is rotating with a black hole, and you have a frame dragging effect so the, the black hole is untraining 
and trying to align all the matter around, uh, align to the black hole spin. And if the gas arrives with a different momentum, it will be quickly aligned with a black hole spin. And then you have a warp, a torque and a warp. And you have two, two uh, cases. If the viscosity of the gas alpha, which is a number, uh, dimensionless number, is large, let's say large with respect to h over r, the height of the disk and the radius, then viscosity will be strong and the gas will not split. It will be warped continuously like this. And if the viscosity is small, then the torque is very high and it will wins out of the viscose torques. And then you will split all the, uh, the disk in small sub-disks. And this is very interesting because when you look at this uh, picture made by Pounds et al. in 2018, you see that uh, all these disks are processing differentially. And when they collide, this is gas, they collide. And then they can exchange very quickly angular momentum. And this explains why you have no problem uh, to remove the angular momentum and the one parsec scale. And this was for a long time the one parsec uh, problem of angular momentum. And it can be uh, resolved by this effect. So we hope to see this kind of effect. And indeed, we see it when you have a higher resolution even than the ALMA, when you have the VLBI. Uh, uh, resolution, for instance, when you are looking at water measures, this is a water measures prototype, 4258, where you see a warped disk, accretion disk around. And 1068, it has also been seen in water measures. And you see that indeed it's rotating disk with a warp. And the warp is exactly due to this transferring effect or bardin peterson effect, which has been simulated by uh, Martin in 2008. And you expect to see that due to the uh, spin of the black hole trying to align the, uh, the gas around it. It has been uh, simulated also by Caprin et al, especially for 1068. You have a radio jet uh, in this direction, I have already uh, mentioned previously. And you see that it is uh, processing also, it's not uh, straight uh, as an unperturbed uh, jet, but it is processing. And the advantage of making the simulation is that you can uh, quantify the time scale to align the gas around the black hole is so typically 10 to the 4 years. 10 to the 4 is very quick with respect to what we see at the larger scale. So we, we know now that uh, you will have this kind of uh, feeling and alignment uh, due to the black hole spin. Now you have also uh, an advantage when you are looking inside the sphere of influence of the black hole is that you can measure the mass of the black hole which is in general not very well known. Here you have 1672. Again, inside the uh, ILR, you have this uh, a small disk. Uh, it is almost face on galaxy, but the, the disk is edge on, you see here. Uh, you see the gradient of velocity in the velocity field. And when you make the PV diagram, velocity and the distance along the major axis of this molecular torus, you see that in 10 parsec scale, you have a gradient of 400 kiloparsec, kilometer per second, sorry. 400 kilometer per second in 10 or 20 parsec along the molecular torus. So if you make a model of this PV diagram with a normal a rotation curve of the galaxy uh, that you can uh, fit with the near infrared image and so on, you have only that. To have this high gradient, you need the black hole. When you need the black hole, you have uh, this peak, which is due to the uh, Keplerian rotation going to one over R, and then you have the normal rotation due to the galaxy. So you have this, and you need a black hole of five ten to the seven solar mass to explain this gradient. So we have done this for all these uh, galaxies. I don't have time to, to show you. And we have not done only at one uh, dimension, the PV diagram, but also uh, using all the uh, two dimension that we have in the velocity field. You see here the observations, the intensity, velocity field, and sigma. And we have tried to fit also the 2D and to have the mass of the black hole. Uh, 10, 1365 or so, we made the model and the observed and so on. So I don't enter into the detail. But uh, this has been done also by the Wisdom Project. They have done a few with ALMA, but now for uh, early time galaxies. So higher mass of the black hole. They have less resolution, but it is enough because the black hole is 
higher than to the A, then the sphere of influence is higher. So here again, another uh, galaxy where you can measure the mass of the black hole. And when you uh, summarize all these data, the wisdom project in blue and the, what we have done with Nougat in red, you see the M sigma relation, uh, the, some other means to measure the mass of black hole are put in gray. And here we say with Alma. So it's not enough yet to say uh, if, for instance, we know that at low mass, you have a big scatter, a high mass is less scatter. We don't know if this scatter is due to the measurement errors because it's very difficult to measure this uh, small mass black hole, or if it is intrinsic uh, scatter, but uh, with more data like this, we'll be able to know about this. And now I will finish uh, rather quickly with trying to uh, explain why we were expecting this non-alignment of the molecular torus and the main disk, because it was known <clears throat> for a while, for instance, 4258, where you have a jet. Here you see this galaxy in, uh, in red, it is a normal galaxy, H alpha, and in blue you see the radio jet and the X-ray jet also. And you see that the jet is perturbed because uh, it looks like a spiral arm, but it's not. But it is perturbed because it is in the plane of the galaxy and it is uh, deflected by the material in the galaxy. We see also the Milky Way, which is seen at John. And when you look at the center, there's this mini spiral and this uh, uh, circumnuclear ring at two, three per second radius in orange. Is orange is HCN. So we can call that a molecular torus also. And it is not a John. So it's uh, decoupled from the rest of the galaxy. So we have many examples like this so that we are not surprised to see this molecular tori, which were uh, misaligned. And when you make a simulation of our Milky Way, which was done by Renault et al, uh, with Rances, for instance, you have several snapshots of the gas. At some point, you have, uh, in the bar galaxy like the Milky Way, you have some instability. You see yeah, there is some star formation done in this far structure. At some point, you have a feedback due to the supernovae, and the gas is going up in the polar direction and it falls back in a fountain effect. And after a while, you see a polar ring. It's very peculiar of this uh, simulation. We have uh, the galaxy disk is there and the polar uh, disk, which is uh, the molecular torus, which is perpendicular. So it can be explained why uh, you have this molecular torus, which is not uh, randomly oriented with respect to the disk. It's because it's very fast to accrete some gas, which has not the same angular momentum. And it will uh, then successively have different angular momentum and randomize the, uh, the spin of the black hole. So in summary, uh, we have seen with ALMA that we know now much better how the IGN is fueled because we have some nuclear spiral structure, trailing spiral structure, which uh, is smoking in evidence of fueling. We have seen molecular outflows in many of the AGNs. So we have not only feeding, but also uh, feedback at the same time. And also the main surprise is to see this uh, decoupled molecular tori, which are very thin, which is not this dusty torus that we're expecting. And we think that uh, we can explain that by uh, the BP effect, the bardeen peterson effect. So thank you very much. I'm expecting your questions. Thank you very much, Francois, for this very nice talk. And then we can open the micro for the questions. Please raise your hand and I will give uh, the word to you. So the first one is uh, Isabel. Hello. So sweet. Um, thank you very much, Fra uh, Francois, for uh, such a wonderful, nice uh, talk. Um, I had just two, two questions or comments or whatever to, to what you've said. Um, since the old times where the, um, the loss of angular momentum was a problem to explain the AGN feeding, now you have very nicely explained mm -hmm. that it can be done because we have a supermassive black hole in the center. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but we have such a supermassive black hole in the center of most galaxies. With All a, galaxies, yeah. Okay. So what will be now the test to know what is happening when you have a, an active or non-active galaxy? Yes, because uh, uh, I think that uh, what we see here is that uh, uh, there is some gas which falls in, but it, it stays 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 years. It would be like, uh, it's not continuous accretion. There will be some uh, giant molecular cloud falling or 
maybe the supernovae feedback that make a fountain effect that's come back. And then you have successive uh, feeding effect. And then for a while, the black hole will be, uh, will be waiting for food. <laughs> and uh, it's not continuously fed. And we can, uh, if you find uh, a frequency of one third feeding and two thirds not, we can say that uh, two thirds of the time he's waiting his food. So, and, and this is compatible with the uh, percentage of active, active, active galaxies. Exactly, active in uh, only one third of cases. So of course, at the end we, can we, find have, we are biased here because we have only taken targets which were already separate. Uh -huh. okay. Still, we, we find some, some galaxies that uh, maybe it's uh, all uh, previous feeding, that's why they are active, but in the next uh, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 years, they will not be active. So, Fine, so it was in, in, in the also old line of saying that it was uh, re recurrent. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. it's recurrent. Okay, and, and the other question is, I'm very much interested on the uh, ionized gas phase. Um, so what what would you expect and what would you say that we can do just to trace the, the, the same, same kind of behavior of feeling and feedback? So, in the uh, and I guess it's very interesting to see uh, the, the feedback also because uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, an important quasar-like, then you have uh, maybe one percent Eddington is sufficient to have this uh, radiation pressure on the ionized gas. And then you see very uh, massive outflow uh, very high velocity. So when you see a velocity of 1,000 kilometers per second, then you can have uh, some people in X-ray, when you are even closer to the black hole, like Tom Bézier et al., they say uh, this ultra-fast outflow, which is 10,000 kilometers per second and so on, but this is X-ray. In INAS gas, H alpha or whatever, you can see uh, 500 to 1,000 kilometers per second. So it is the beginning of the flow. And then it entrains the gas, molecular gas. The molecular gas is uh, 300, 400 kilometers per second because it's, it's slowed down. So uh, maybe there are more mass in the molecular outflow, less mass in the ionized, but the ionized gas has larger velocity, so it's more easy to see. Okay, so it'll be wonderful to be able to compare both faces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have uh, another question by Christina. Please go on. Hello. Hi, Hello, Christina. How are you? I don't know if I'm allowed to ask because I'm an intruder here. <laughs> you can ask. Yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so, uh, thank you. Very super nice uh, talk. Uh, so, one thing I would like to ask you is uh, so, for this inflow that you measure uh, with ALMA in molecular gas, which, which is the maximum velocity that these uh, inflows uh, can have? The inflow, you don't measure the velocity because the inflow is uh, rotating. Mm -hmm. So it has the rotation velocity of the rest of the gas. It's only that it spirals down and we cannot measure the inflow directly. We have to measure the torque because the inflow is very slow. You know, it's uh, rotating and it loses progressively in one or two rotation, we can measure the outflow. It's violent, it's 300 kilometers per second outflow. It's not in rotation, the outflow. So it's minor axis. When you have on the minor axis 300 kilometers per second, you measure the outflow. But the inflow, you cannot measure. Because in general, when you have a bar, you have elliptical streamlines. So many people say, well, we have, as you know very well, <laughs> because we have done with you also, some of the analysis where you have elliptical streamlines and we never know if it is an outflow or a rotation with elliptical streamline. It's never circular. When you have a bar, you cannot have circular motion. It's not possible because the potential is not circular. So you have always elliptical streamlines, either parallel to the bar, perpendicular, but it's always elliptical. So when you try to measure an minor axis, you have non-streaming, uh, non-circular motion. This non-circular motion could be only an ellipse, and you never know if it is going out or in. Exactly. You have to measure the torques to know if it is going in or out. But even with a non-circular motion, it's not sufficient to know uh, the sense of, uh, because sometimes they can go from the center. We have seen that uh, in the 1433, we have seen that the, the torque is positive 
from the center to uh, 20%, it's positive. So the gas is uh, driven out to be accumulated in the second ILR, mm -hmm. but it's positive, it doesn't go in. Okay. So but it's not because it is at 10% that is going, it can be still driven out to store during a, a while to the ILR and then it, uh, you need something else like a nuclear bar that uh, make the, the, the sense of rotation different and so on. But uh, you have to measure the torque for, for the feeling. For the outflow, it's more direct. You measure the velocity. Okay, thank you. And uh, if I can uh, ask another thing, well, it's, it's more a comment, but well, also a question. So about the, what you have to say about the, um, the polar dust, yeah. It's true that at least in some galaxies, it looks like there is, a, I mean, most of the infrared emission is dominated by the polar dust, but there is also dust in the equatorial plane, right? Because yes. even, the, even Sebastian's models, they need a polar component and the... And the yes, diesel. yes. If I can show this, uh, yes. You have still a lot here also, yes. Yeah. And, and even with gamma, sometimes you see the, the torus in, the, in CO, but you also may may see the, the cold dust, right? If you yeah. if you have band nine or something like that. Yes, but in 1068, you remember with the uh, yeah. it was in the polar. <laughs> the dust was in the polar direction. <laughs> but the, the, it, I, I was emphasizing the thing that uh, finally the obscuration might be due to this dust, mm -hmm. and you uh, had not a cipher one but a cipher two. You could be uh, obscured by the dust, which is in the polar cone, but not here. It depends on if you are at 90 degrees or not. But if you are at 75 degrees, you are not obscured by this one. You are obscured by this one. Mm. Yeah. And the, the cross-section is much higher. So the probability that you are exactly at John is not high because it's very thin. And the probability that you are obscured by the polar cone is higher than uh, with, uh, with this. Because it's not a very thick disk here, I, like uh, Sebastian has shown, the dust here is a thin disk. It's not a dusty torus. It's not thick, like uh, the unification model that were very thick. In the Uri and Padovani uh, thing, it was very thick. Just to have the probability to uh, of obscuration. But now it's solved by this polar cone. So even if you are not 90 degrees, you're 80 or 70, you are obscured by this, not by this, but by this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We have another question by Isabel. Mm, okay. So, um, uh, could it be still possible that we have the dusty torus in the in the plane, but that the scale is so? I mean, the size is so small that we cannot resolve it. Uh, so we, we see the dust, the polar dust, because the extension is much larger. Yes, yes, uh, I'm sure uh, if you prolong, this is a cut, if you prolong uh, and you are exactly at 90 degrees, you will be obscured by this uh, dust disk. But the problem is that the, the probability to have this uh, is low because your, your uh, angle of view will be like this. So you will be obscured by this, in fact. Yeah, so but the dusty torus is due to the polar orientation of the Yeah, but, but I'm, not, I'm not talking about the origin of the obscuration, but the uh, origin of the non-detection of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the torus. Ah, the yes, plane. because in fact, uh, there is a very small amount of the, well, it's a que question of quantity. I'm sure there is small dust here, but it's a very small one. And when we measure it with ALMA, we, we see the CO in this direction, but we see the dust emission here. I'm sure there is also some here, but uh, we are just at the sensitivity limit. So we are detecting the most abundant dust mm -hmm. and the most abundant dust is there. And then there is dust here. I agree with you, there is dust here, but uh, it's very small. Yeah, much less than expected. That's why okay. there is more dust in the polar cone than in the disk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other question for Francois? Seems there is no more questions. I want to thank again, Francois, thank for this uh, very nice talk. And we will upload the, the, the talk in our uh, YouTube channel and give the, the link for everybody.
Isabel, you want to say something? Um, I ju just to end up but by saying thank you very much, Françoise, for, for uh, I mean, for, for being able, I mean, and, and available for participating in, in, in our web, uh, Lokia, as we, we call them. Um, and I, I expect that you will be able to come here personally yeah. once we are recovered from this uh, pandemia. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye. bye.